Thank you for joining this virtual presentation on the Oregon Board of Pharmacy's new regulations. We'll be focusing on Oregon Administrative Rules Chapter 855, Division 115, related to pharmacists, which comes into effect on March 1, 2024. This presentation is designed to help all licensees and registrants, especially pharmacists, understand and comply with these important updates. The mission of the Oregon Board of Pharmacy is to promote and protect public health, safety, and welfare by ensuring high standards in the practice of pharmacy and through effective regulation of the manufacture and distribution of drugs. By the end of this virtual presentation, participants will demonstrate an understanding of licensee and registrant responsibilities related to record retention, confidentiality, and mandatory reporting to the board accurately summarize the key requirements, procedures, and potential consequences related to pharmacist licensure in Oregon, identify key responsibilities of pharmacists, including those related to general duties, personnel, security, counseling, drug utilization review, and delivering clinical services. The assessment questions for this presentation are, which of the following events does a licensee not have to report to the board within 10 days? being convicted of a misdemeanor, being cited for a parking violation, being arrested for a felony, having reasonable cause to believe that another licensee has engaged in prohibited conduct. Regarding record retention, which of the following statements is true? All records must be stored in a written format only. Continuing pharmacy education records must be retained for six years. Clinical pharmacy records must be retained for at least 10 years and registrants must store all records on site indefinitely. Which of the following is not a general requirement for a pharmacist in any practice setting? Using due care, skill, and professional judgment when dispensing medications, being responsible for the actions of supervised personnel, complying with all relevant state and federal pharmacy laws and regulations, ensuring availability of reference material and equipment needed, completing a controlled substance inventory with discrepancy reconciliation. In cases where counseling must be offered for a prescription and a patient declines, who cannot accept the refusal? Any licensed staff member, any pharmacist or intern, a certified organ pharmacy technician or pharmacy technician, a non-licensed pharmacy clerk. How many interns can a pharmacist supervise when the intern is performing direct patient care activities? Up to two, up to four, up to 10, as many as they believe is appropriate. Before we discuss the new rules, let's first take a high level look at the laws and rules that govern the practice of pharmacy. First, there are federal laws that govern pharmacy practice in every state. These are found in the United States Code or USC and are enacted by Congress and signed into law by the president. Examples of USC that apply to pharmacy are 21 USC, which contains the Controlled Substances Act and the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The Drug Supply Security Chain Act is also contained in 21 USC within the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The Code of Federal Regulations are enacted by federal agencies, such as the FDA, Drug, Food and Drug Administration, or the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration. For example, 21 CFR contains the regulations related to the DEA. There are also state laws that govern the practice of pharmacy in Oregon, which are found in the Oregon Revised Statutes, or ORS, and are enacted by the state legislature and signed into law by the governor. Chapters of ORS that apply to pharmacy are ORS 689 and ORS 475. The Oregon Administrative Rules are enacted by state agencies like the Board of Pharmacy. OAR 855 contains the rules enacted by the Board of Pharmacy. Other OAR chapters contain rules enacted by other state agencies, like the Oregon Medical Board and OAR 847, and the Oregon Health Authority and OAR 333. In some cases, the Board will adopt an outside standard by reference in the OARs. Board rules adopt specific USC's CFRs, and even standards set by outside organizations, like the United States Pharmacopeia, which is a private standard setting organization. Incorporation by reference, as this process is called, occurs when any state agency adopts a government rule or other published standard 
that in effect says that it is adopting that federal law or private standard as written, making it legally binding in the state. For example, USP Chapter 795 on non-sterile compounding and USP Chapter 797 on sterile compounding are standards that have been adopted by reference in OAR 855 and are enforceable in the state for the version stated in the rule. Board of Pharmacy laws are written and enforced under an area of law called administrative law. Other major areas of law that you may be familiar with are civil law and criminal law. The board is always in the process of updating pharmacy rules. In 2020, the board directed agency staff to update all of the rules contained in OAR 855. As a result, the board is in the midst of a major overhaul of all of its rules under Chapter 855. This means you can expect significant updates over the next few years, especially regarding outlets and license types. Here's what's happening. The board is revamping the entire rule structure. New rules will be numbered in the 100s and organized in a more logical way. Definitions will now come first, followed by keyboard information like procedures, policies, and fees. A dedicated division for public health emergencies will come next, as these rules modify licensees and outlet rules when a public health emergency is in effect. Next up, clear divisions will be created for different license types, making it easier to find relevant rules. This is primarily what we'll be covering today. Then, each type of outlet, retail pharmacy, institutional pharmacy, will have its own designated division. And finally, other types of drug outlets, also known as facilities, manufacturers and wholesalers, will have updated rules. While it's important to note that this is still a work in progress, the final structure and numbering of the divisions may change before all of the rules are finalized. You should keep an eye on the board website and communication for updates on the rule revision process. As the new rules roll out, there may be adjustments needed to your operations and procedures. Stay informed and be ready to adapt. The rules in italics on this slide have already been revised. The rules in bold are currently being revised. At the August 2023 board meeting, the board adopted new rules effective March 1st, 2024 for Divisions 102, Board Administration, Division 104, Universal Rules, Division 115, Pharmacist, Division 120, In Terms and Preceptors, and Division 125, Certified Organ Pharmacy Technicians and Pharmacy Technicians. Today's presentation will focus on the new rules for pharmacists found in OAR 855, Division 115, and the Universal Rules in Division 104 that also apply to pharmacists. The rules in Division 104 are universal rules. These rules apply to all licensees and registrants, which includes pharmacists and pharmacies. The rules highlighted in yellow on the next slide will be discussed further in the presentation. Let me first quickly review um, the other rules in Division 104. 855-104-0005 stipulates that applicants, licensees, and registrants are obligated to promptly adhere to all board requests, including providing accurate and complete responses to inquiries, submitting requested materials within specified timelines, and complying with subpoenas, as well as adhering to the terms outlined in board orders and agreements. 855-104-0050 mandates that board licensees and registrants must provide patients or their representatives with access to their pharmacy health information upon request, allowing inspection and copying of the record with certain exceptions defined by law and the rule, and emphasizes compliance with the specified time frame for responding to requests, not to exceed 30 days. 855-104-0060 is currently under development. The rule will clearly outline how to request public records from the board. The next three rules, OAR 855-104-0100, 105, and 110, are about cases and hearings. 855-104-0115 empowers a board authorized compliance officer to conduct inspections at any drug outlet during reasonable hours allowing for inspection of various elements, including conditions, drugs, and records, with licensees and employees obligated to fully cooperate and refusal to permit inspection is deemed grounds for disciplinary action. 
104-005-0150 facilitates the licensure of military spouses or domestic partners in Oregon. Now let's look at three of the rules in Division 104 more closely. First, OAR 855-104-0010. Licensees must promptly report to the board within 10 days or 10 working days in specific cases any convictions, felony arrest, or suspected violations of relevant laws, as well as report any reasonable cause to believe that another licensee has engaged in prohibited or unprofessional conduct. Licensees are required to report any changes in their legal name, names used in pharmacy practice, preferred email address, personal phone number, personal physical and mailing addresses, and employer within 15 days. A licensee who in good faith reports as mandated by ORS 676150 or ORS 689455 is granted immunity from civil liability, ensuring protection for pharmacists, certified Oregon pharmacy technicians, pharmacy technicians against civil damages resulting from such reporting. Please note, an intern is not listed in paren 3. For reasons unknown, the legislators did not include interns in the specific pharmacy law. However, interns are included in the general law for health professions in ORS 676150. Now for the second rule, OAR 855-104-0015. Licensees or registrants of the board are prohibited from disclosing patient information to third parties without patient consent except as specified in the rule, which allows disclosure to the board, authorized health care practitioners, third parties as required or permitted by law, and to the patient or authorized individuals with a prohibition on unauthorized access or acquisition of patient information. And finally, the third rule, OAR 855-104-0055. Each licensee and registrant is required to create and securely retain documents and records as specified by ORS 475, ORS 689, and OAR 855, with a general retention period of three years, extended to seven years for clinical pharmacy records. Certified or pharmacists must maintain training records related to immunization administration for six years or upload the documents into the licensee's electronic licensing record in eGov. Records generated by a registrant, also known as a pharmacy, may be stored on site for at least 12 months, provided to the board immediately upon request during an inspection, and may be stored off-site after 12 months to be provided within three business days upon request. Records not belonging to a registrant must be securely stored by a pharmacist and provided to the board within three business days with the possibility of longer retention periods if required by a federal law or due to a board investigation or request. Before we explore the new regulations in Division 115, let's refresh ourselves on the Oregon Revised Statutes that form their foundation. This will help us understand the roles and responsibility of our licensees, pharmacists, interns, and pharmacy technicians, all of whom play a crucial role in medication dispensing and patient care. Let's start with the definitions. In ORS 689005, paren 27, a pharmacist means an individual licensed by the state to engage in the practice of pharmacy or to engage in the practice of clinical pharmacy. An intern means a person who is enrolled in or has completed a course of study at a school or college of pharmacy approved by the board and who is licensed with the board as an intern. And a pharmacy technician means a person licensed by the State Board of Pharmacy who assists the pharmacist in the practice of pharmacy pursuant to the rules of the board. It's essential to understand that only a pharmacist can engage in the practice of pharmacy. An intern who is supervised by a pharmacist may engage in the practice of pharmacy when permitted by the supervising pharmacist. And while crucial, crucial to the process, a technician is not permitted to engage in the practice of pharmacy, but they can assist a pharmacist who is engaging in the practice of pharmacy. As I mentioned earlier, ORS 689-005 contains the laws related to pharmacy. Um, in Oregon, only a pharmacist can engage in the practice of pharmacy. And 689-005, paren 31, defines what is the practice of pharmacy. 
let's explore some key activities that fall under this umbrella. Interpretation and evaluation of prescriptions. This is a critical task that ensures patients receive the right medication at the right dosage. By law, only a pharmacist is authorized to interpret and evaluate prescriptions. An intern may interpret and evaluate as permitted by their supervising pharmacist. A technician may assist the pharmacist in interpreting and evaluating prescription by performing data entry of a prescription in the pharmacy software. A pharmacist is responsible for verifying the technician's work is accurate and that the patient receives the right medication at the right dosage. Compounding, dispensing, and labeling. From mixing personalized medications to applying accurate labels, these steps safeguard patient safety and medication effectiveness. Only a pharmacist is authorized to compound, dispense, and label drugs. An intern may compound, dispense, and label as permitted by their supervising pharmacist. A technician may assist the pharmacist in compounding, dispensing, and labeling. A pharmacist is again responsible for verifying that the technician's work is accurate and that the patient receives the right medication that is properly labeled. Patient care services. Beyond dispensing pills, pharmacists actively manage medication therapy, assess risk, and provide comprehensive medication reviews. Only a pharmacist can provide the patient care services, such as medication therapy management or comprehensive medication reviews. An intern who has completed their first academic year may provide these services as permitted by their supervising pharmacist. And a technician can assist the pharmacist in these activities by obtaining the medication list from the patient, their pharmacy, or another healthcare provider, and then entering it into the patient's pharmacy record. Then the pharmacist must verify the technician's work when they per before they perform the patient care service. Remember, the dividing line is clear. Any task requiring judgment, independent decision-making, or direct patient interaction falls within the practice of pharmacy and must be performed by the pharmacist or an intern as permitted by their supervising pharmacist. Technicians, while invaluable, support these activities under the pharmacist's supervision and cannot independently engage in them. Every step in dispensing medication, from interpretation to dispensing, must involve the pharmacist oversight and verification to ensure patient safety and optimal care. Note that in 31 paren I, the practice of pharmacy also includes the optimizing of drug therapy through the practice of clinical pharmacy. This practice has a separate definition. The practice of clinical pharmacy is defined in ORS 689.005 paren 30 and is a part of the practice of pharmacy. In paren A, clinical pharmacy involves a pharmacist working with a patient's healthcare provider to optimize medication therapy. The goal is to achieve the best possible health outcomes for the patient using medications effectively and safely. In paren B, pharmacists can provide patient care services beyond dispensing medications. This includes managing chronic conditions after a diagnosis. And in paren C, the practice of clinical pharmacy can be formalized through a clinical pharmacy agreement with a healthcare provider. The definition of a clinical pharmacy agreement can be found in ORS 689.005 paren 4. There are not rules specific to clinical pharmacy agreements at this time. Pharmacy technicians are integral to patient safety and medication accuracy. They assist pharmacists in providing efficient and effective care. This slide focuses on two key Oregon revised statutes, ORS 689.225 and ORS 689.486. These statutes outline the responsibilities of both the State Board of Pharmacy and licensed pharmacists in overseeing and supervising pharmacy technicians. ORS 689.225 Parent 4 requires that the State Board of Pharmacy establish rules for pharmacy technicians working under the supervision, direction, and control of pharmacists. The law requires that the rules written by the board contain guidelines for adequate supervision of a technician by a pharmacist. ORS 689.486 Parent 6 emphasizes the pharmacist's ultimate responsibility for the pharmacy technician's work. It states, a person licensed to perform the duties of a pharmacy technician may perform the duties of a pharmacy technician only under the supervision, direction, and control of a licensed pharmacist. Supervision means watching over and guiding someone to ensure they are doing things correctly. Direction means telling someone what to do or how to do something. And control means having the power to determine the outcome of someone's actions. 
In other words, supervision, direction, and control of a technician means that the pharmacists are not only responsible for overseeing the technician's work, but also for ensuring the accuracy and safety of all medication-related tasks performed under their supervision. As a reminder, an intern is also required to be under the supervision of a licensed pharmacist. Now let's turn our focus to the new pharmacist rules in Division 115. This division applies to any pharmacist engaging in the practice of pharmacy in Oregon. Only individuals licensed with the board as pharmacists can practice pharmacy. These persons must act in compliance with statutes and rules unless an exemption applies. In paren three, the board adopts by rule an exemption from licensure for pharmacists who are not the pharmacist in charge, who work for an out-of-state pharmacy, and only perform the professional task of interpretation, evaluation, DUR, counseling, and verification associated with their dispensing of a drug to a patient in Oregon. To obtain your pharmacist's license, you must meet certain qualifications based on how you want to become licensed. One option is by examination. You can take and pass the NAPLEX exam or transfer your exam score. Or if you're already licensed as a pharmacist in another state, you can use the reciprocity process. If you live in the United States, you will need to provide proof of your citizenship, legal permanent residency, or qualifying visa as required by federal law in 8 U.S.C. 1621. And if you graduated from a pharmacy school outside of the United States, you must also meet specific requirements before applying for a pharmacist license in Oregon. I'm not going to go through each of the rules about licensure qualifications in detail, but I'll give you a quick review of their content. In OAR 855-115-0015, an applicant for pharmacist licensure with a foreign educational background must fulfill the following education criteria. Obtaining certification from the Foreign Pharmacy Graduate Examination Committee, FPGEC, and submitting evidence of 1,440 hours of pharmacy practice in the United States. However, graduates from specified programs or jurisdictions are exempt from certain requirements. An internship hours completed before FPGEC certification cannot be counted times toward the 1440 hour practice requirement. In OAR 855-115-0020, to attain licensure as a pharmacist through examination or score transfer, an applicant must fulfill various criteria, including presenting evidence of degree conferment and completion of a minimum of 1440 hours of internship program passing the NAPLEX and Oregon MPJE exams, and completing one hour of continuing pharmacy education and pain management. However, applicants with professional degrees obtained outside the United States are ineligible until they meet specific requirements. And those applying via score transfer must request the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, or NABP, to transfer their NAPLEX score to Oregon. In OAR 855-115-0025, an applicant seeking licensure as a pharmacist through reciprocity must meet various requirements, including being a graduate of an ACPE accredited college or school pharmacy, passing the NAPLEX and Oregon MPJE exams, providing proof of active pharmacist licenses without significant restrictions, and demonstrating either 12 months of pharmacy practice with a minimum of 1,440 hours, or completing a 1,440-hour internship program within the 12-month period before applying. While applicants with professional degree degrees obtained outside the United States and jurisdiction are ineligible until they fulfill the prerequisites mentioned in the first rule on the slide. Let's go and do a quick review of the content of other licensure rules. OAR 855-115-0030 talks about the application process for pharmacist licensure, uh, accessing the application on the board's website, submitting evidence of compliance with licensure qualifications, completing the application form with necessary documents and fees, undergoing a national fingerprint-based background check, and providing information on moral turpitude with penalties applicable for incomplete or inaccurate disclosures, and an expired application requiring reapplication within 90 days for consider continued consideration. Pharmacist licenses expire on June 30th and odd number of years and may be renewed by any. OAR 855-115-0035. 
To renew a pharmacist's license, an applicant must pay the biennial license fee, fulfill continuing education requirements, undergo a criminal background check, and disclose relevant conduct. If a license has lapsed for over 12 months, it requires reinstatement and it has additional steps, including examination retakes and compliance with specified timeframes. And those with retired licenses for more than 12 months must fulfill reinstatement requirements. While individuals with suspended, revoked, or restricted licenses can petition the board for reinstatement at reasonable intervals during the process. OAR 855-115-0040, a pharmacist may allow their license to lapse by not renewing it before the expiration date. And while the lapse itself is not discipline, the board retains the authority to investigate or take disciplinary action. Practicing pharmacy during the lapse is prohibited and individuals can apply for license renewal or reinstatement following the procedures outlined in that rule. Um, the license remains effective until the lapse is accepted by the board which uh, the board will notify the licensee of the termination date unless an ongoing investigation or disciplinary action is pending. OAR 855-115-0045. A pharmacist in good standing and licensed for at least 20 years may request the board to retire their license if no longer practicing pharmacy. And though a retired license is not disciplined, the board retains authority under ORS 689-153. And individuals must refrain from practicing pharmacy during the retirement period with the option to apply for renewal or reinstatement according to that rule. If the request to retire is made before the license expiration date, the license remains effective until the board accepts the retire request and the board notifies the licensee of its inactive status. In OAR 855-115-0050, a pharmacist may request the voluntary surrender of their license, which constitutes discipline. And though the license remains active until the board accepts the surrender, upon acceptance, a final order is issued marking the termination date, after which the licensee must cease pharmacy practice, and the surrendered license is ineligible for renewal, requiring a former licensee to apply for reinstatement in accordance with the rule. Unless the final order specifies otherwise, the, with the board retaining jurisdiction for investigations and or other disciplinary actions. In 855-115-0060, the pharmacist has the option to register with the board for limited liability um, specified in ORS 676-340 allowing exemptions from liability for providing uncompensated or volunteer pharmacy services, with the board issuing a no-cost registration upon a completed application. And while the registration expires at the next license renewal date, it can be biannually renewed. The pharmacist remains accountable for compliance with board regulations and may be subject to disciplinary actions as outlined in ORS 676-175. OAR 855-115-0065, a pharmacist who is not licensed in Oregon may without compensation and in connection with coordinating organization or other entity practice pharmacy for 30 days each calendar year in the state of Oregon. And to do so, the pharmacist must submit the required information to the board at least 10 days before commencing practice, acknowledging compliance with the state's scope of practice and agreeing not to receive compensation while being subject to the laws and the rules governing the pharmacy profession and potential disciplinary action by the appropriate health professional regulatory board. In OAR 855-115-0070, to qualify as a nuclear pharmacist under these rules, a pharmacist must meet minimum standards of training and experience in handling radioactive materials, hold an Oregon pharmacy license, and submit evidence of either current certification in nuclear pharmacy by the Board of Pharmacy Specialties or certification of minimum of six months on-the-job training and completion of nuclear pharmacy training program. And upon meeting these requirements, receive a letter of notification from the board. Before we cover the general responsibilities of pharmacists, let's explore how these updated rules differ from the previous rules. These new regulations are designed to encompass the diverse nature of pharmacy practice in today's world, where pharmacists aren't always confined to brick and mortar stores. Remember, pharmacy has evolved significantly since the last set of rules was written. Those rules primarily focused on pharmacists working in traditional pharmacies. 
These new regulations consider situations where pharmacists provide cognitive services, even without physical drugs on hand. Therefore, you'll see some of the responsibilities that were previously assigned to the pharmacist in charge of a drug outlet now falling on every pharmacist, regardless of their practice setting. While there are additional obligations for pharmacists working in drug outlets or serving as PICs, these core responsibilities apply to every pharmacist. Now, for OAR 855-115-0105. When practicing pharmacy in Oregon, pharmacists must always act with the care and judgment of a responsible and skilled pharmacist, taking into account the specific situation and circumstances. Take full responsibility for their own actions and decisions, even though the pharmacy itself may also be held accountable. Supervise and be responsible for the actions of everyone under their supervision, including pharmacy interns, technicians, and any non-licensed personnel. Pharmacists must also always comply with all applicable state and federal laws and rules, oversee and manage every aspect of pharmacy practice, fulfill your professional duties appropriately as expected of a competent pharmacist, and make sure you have necessary reference materials and equipment readily available for those that are performing pharmacy services. And, all pharmacists must ensure that patients receive necessary interpretation and translation services as required by ORS 689-564. This means making sure they understand all the information and can communicate effectively with you. In Parin 9, provide services in a clean, secure, and confidential environment to protect patient privacy and ensure medication safety. Pharmacists must always wear a name tag or identify themselves as a pharmacist during all interactions. That includes phone calls and chart notations. And clearly display your pharmacist license within the pharmacy or place of business where you practice. Pharmacists must also be involved in a program that helps constantly improve the quality of services provided. Always review, follow, and actively enforce written policies and procedures of your practice. This is important for both safety and consistency in providing excellent care. Before you begin practicing pharmacy, make sure you've thoroughly reviewed the policies and procedures of either the pharmacy or of your practice. Whenever written policies or procedures change, make sure you are aware of the updates and how to understand to and understand how to implement them. Document that you've reviewed the policies and procedures and keep these records as required by the Record Retention Rule and OAR 855-104-0055, which we covered earlier. Pharmacists are mandated to report to the board in accordance with OAR 855-104-0010 and adhere to OAR 855-104-0015 on confidentiality which are two rules I covered earlier in the presentation. In addition to those requirements, pharmacists must immediately report to the board within one business day any instances of confirmed significant drug loss and any losses related to suspected theft of controlled substances. OAR 855-115-0120 outlines pharmacist responsibilities related to personnel. Remember, these responsibilities apply to every pharmacist, regardless of their setting, and not just the PIC of a drug outlet. When practicing pharmacy, every pharmacist in Oregon must, for an A, make sure all personnel who require licenses have them, and that they're valid and in good standing with the board. In Parent B, ensure licensed personnel only perform tasks that fall within the boundaries of their specific licenses. For in C, closely oversee non-pharmacist personnel to guarantee they only perform duties they're properly licensed and trained to do. Additionally, related to personnel, pharmacists must, per D, always be aware of the identities of everyone under your supervision, including interns, certified organ pharmacy technicians, and pharmacy technicians. Ensure interns only practice pharmacy under direct pharmacist supervision following the guidelines in OAR 855-120, which includes specific supervision ratios. 
or in F, guarantee that technicians only assist with pharmacy tasks under the direct supervision of a pharmacist who is providing supervision, direction, and control as outlined in OAR 855-125. When practicing pharmacy in Oregon, pharmacists must actively ensure that both they and the individuals they supervise maintain their skills and knowledge through continuous education and training. Or in K, manage their workload and the number of people they supervise to ensure they can provide adequate oversight and maintain patient safety. In ORS 689-005-310, the practice of pharmacy is, include, is defined as including the delegation of tasks to other healthcare providers who are appropriately trained and authorized to perform the delegated task. In Paren 2, it permits pharmacists to delegate specific pharmacy tasks to other qualified healthcare providers, but only if those providers have the appropriate training and authorization to perform those tasks. This rule outlines the pharmacist's responsibilities related to supervision. Pharmacists can supervise as many certified organ pharmacy technicians or pharmacy technicians as they deem appropriate in their professional judgment to ensure patient health, safety, and well being. As a reminder, pharmacists must always supervise direct and control technicians' work unless the technician is performing final verification or vaccine administration, which are two tasks that the pharmacist can delegate to technicians but still require supervision. More details on these two tasks are available in the informational program on OAR 855-125 related to technicians. Pharmacists are encouraged to watch all of the new licensee rule informational programs as they are responsible for supervising interns and supervising, directing, and controlling technicians. Now, for Paren 2, when supervising interns, pharmacists can supervise a maximum of four interns directly involved in patient care activities, such as counseling or dispensing medications. In Paren B, Pharmacists can supervise as many interns as they deem appropriate in their professional judgment to ensure patient health, safety, and well-being when the interns are engaged in non-direct patient care activities, such as research or administrative tasks, or informational health fairs where interns provide general, non-specific, non-patient-specific information. Again, more detail on the supervision requirement is in the informational program on, in OAR 855-120 related to interns and preceptors. Now let's transition to the pharmacist's responsibility for drugs, records, and security. Remember, these responsibilities apply to every pharmacy in every setting, not just the PIC. In Paren 1A, pharmacists must establish robust measures to prevent loss, theft, or diversion of prescription drugs, pharmacy records, and patient information. This might involve having secure storage areas with restricted access, inventory control procedures, and policies for handling and disposing of medications. In Paren 1B, pharmacists must restrict access to storage areas containing prescription drugs, pharmacy records, and patient information, ensuring only authorized individuals can enter. That might involve key card or password protected systems, sign in and sign out logs, clear identification badges. In Paren 2, pharmacists must ensure all pharmacy and patient records are maintained in strict compliance with applicable state and federal laws and regulations. In Paren 3, pharmacists can only obtain drugs from organ registered drug outlets, such as wholesalers, manufacturers, or other licensed pharmacies. This ensures the drug's legitimacy and quality. In Paren 4, pharmacists must comply with specific drug storage rules outlined in OAR 855-041-1036. These rules govern aspects such as temperature control, humidity, lighting, sanitation, and ventilation to main tr maintain drugs' integrity and safety. In Paren 5, pharmacists must take immediate action to quarantine and physically separate any drugs or devices that are recalled by the manufacturer, outdated or expired, damaged or deteriorated, misbranded or adulterated, suspected of being counterfeit or illegitimate, otherwise deemed unfit for dispensing or administration. In Paren 6, pharmacists must meticulously follow the rules and standards outlined in OAR 855-045 when preparing any compounded drugs. 
These regulations ensure the quality, safety, and effectiveness of compounded medications. In parent seven, pharmacists must implement robust me measures to safeguard patient information that is stored in pharmacy computer systems. By establishing and maintaining secure connections to patient information databases, implementing strict access controls, and configuring computer, computer systems to prohibit the duplication, downloading, or removal of patient information when accessed remotely. Pharmacists, like other healthcare providers, medical doctors, nurse practitioners, also must meticulously document and maintain accurate records. In Paren 8A, clearly documenting the specific services provided to patients, such as dispensing medications, providing consultations, or conducting medication reviews. In Paren B, recording the date, time, and identifying information of the pharmacist involved in each activity or function performed. Paren C, maintaining detailed records pertaining to the acquisition, storage, and dispensing and administration and disposal of all drugs and devices within the pharmacy. Pharmacists are responsible for reporting specific data to designated systems as required by state and federal regulations. This includes, in Paren 9A, electronically reporting all administered immunizations to the alert IIS statewide database that tracks vaccination records for Oregon residents. In Paren 9B, reporting communicable diseases to the Oregon Health Authority as mandated by ORS 433-004. A pharmacist would typically be involved in this type of reporting if they ordered a laboratory test and received confirmation of a disease that is required to be reported. In Paren 9C, reporting any suspected adverse events following immunization to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, which is a national database co-managed by the FDA and the CDC. All of the responsibilities we've discussed previously apply to every pharmacy, regardless of the setting they're in or if they're PIC. However, this specific rule, an OAR 855-115-0130, outlines additional requirements specifically for all pharmacists working in drug outlets, also known as pharmacies, not just the PIC. In Paren 1A, pharmacists bear the full responsibility for the daily conduct, operation, management, and control of the drug outlet pharmacy. In Paren B, pharmacists must ensure that they, that only authorized persons have, pharmacists, sorry, have access to the drug outlet pharmacy when it's closed. This safeguards the security of the medications and patient information. There is an exception and rule permitted in OAR 855-041-6310, which outlines after hours access to a hospital pharmacy. In Paren 1C, pharmacists must ensure that every prescription dispensed from the pharmacy contains all the mandatory elements that are listed in OAR 855041 and OAR 855139. In 1D, pharmacists must ensure that patient records are maintained, maintained within the drug outlet pharmacy contain all of the elements, again, in OAR 855041 or OAR 855139. In Paren 1E, pharmacists must ensure that all prescriptions, refills, and drug orders are dispensed accurately to the correct party, pursuant to a valid prescription, pursuant to a valid patient-practitioner relationship, and for a legitimate medical purpose. And in Paren 1F, the pharmacist must ensure the drug outlet pharmacy operates professionally at all times. Pharmacists practicing in accordance with ORS 689 for a drug outlet must dispense prep prescriptions accurately. Pharmacists must also ensure the drug outlet pharmacy complies with all federal and state regulations regarding data reporting. This includes, but isn't limited to, ensuring the outlet, and one little g, big A, accurately and timely reports dispense controlled substance prescriptions to the Oregon PDMP, a statewide database designed to track controlled substance prescribing and dispensing patterns. In Paren 1 GB, adheres to strict reporting requirements for medications dispensed under Oregon's Death with Dignity Act, or DWDA, which allows terminally ill patients to request medication to end their lives voluntarily. And 1GC complies with federal regulations for the reporting of controlled substance transactions, including acquisition, dispensing, and inventory to the DEA. In Paren 1GD, 
reports any transactions involving listed chemicals, which are substances commonly used in the illicit production of controlled substances and include pseudoephedrine and ephedrine. In paren two, pharmacists who manage licensees working remotely must adhere to the regulations outlined at OAR 855-041-3200 through OAR 855-041-3250. Under specific conditions, pharmacists can delegate the final verification of drugs to pharmacy technicians in Oregon. In 2022, a law, House Bill 4034, added final verification as a task that can be completed by a technician when the pharmacist permits them to do so. This final verification is not what was traditionally referred to as final verification in pharmacies. The law gave final verification a very different and specific meaning set by the legislature. In the law, final verification means after prescription information is entered into the pharmacy's electronic system and reviewed by a pharmacist for accuracy, a physical verification that the drug and drug dosage, device, or product selected from a pharmacy's inventory pursuant to the electronic system entry is the prescribed drug and drug dosage, device, or product. Please note that the law does not permit a technician to verify the expiration date, quantity, or dosage form, just the drug and dosage, device, or product. This activity is discussed in greater detail in the information program on New Technician Division of Rules and OAR 855-125. In paren 3A, if the pharmacist permits final verification by the technician, the delegation of this task is subject to strict safeguards. In paren A, the pharmacist must exercise reasonable professional judgment to determine if the technician is capable of accurately performing final verification. In paren B, the technician cannot exercise personal discretion or judgment during final verification. If discretion or judgment is needed, then the pharmacist must verify the technician's work. In paren C, the pharmacist must supervise the technician throughout the final verification process, ensuring accuracy and adherence to standards. And in paren D, the pharmacist must guarantee that the technician performs a physical, hands-on final verification of the drug, dosage form, device, or product, as opposed to solely relying on electronic records or images. The next two rules that I'm going to cover are core pharmacist responsibilities that occur no matter the practice setting, drug utilization review and counseling. OAR 855-115-0140 lists the requirements for DUR. Pharmacists are required to conduct a drug utilization review before dispensing each prescription drug or device, aiming to identify issues such as overutilization, underutilization, therapeutic duplication, contraindications, tr interactions, incorrect dosage, inappropriate duration, allergy interactions, and drug abuse. Any concerns must be addressed, documented, and resolved by the pharmacist. This rule highlights the pharmacist's responsibility to provide appropriate counseling regarding medication use. In paren one, pharmacists must determine the specific amount and manner of counseling needed for each prescription on a case-by-case -case basis. This ensures relevant information is provided based on the individual patient's needs and circumstances. In paren two, in certain situations, counseling is mandatory and must be provided or offered to the patient or their agent. When a medication is dispensed for the first time at the drug outlet pharmacy, when there's a change in the dose, formulation, or directions for an existing medication, when a prescription is transferred to the drug outlet from another pharmacy, regardless of the method, oral, written, or electronic for any refill where the pharmacist deems counseling is necessary based on the potential risk or patient's needs. And while pharmacists ultimately provide counseling, the initial offer for counseling under sections one and two of the rule can be made by any licensed staff member in the pharmacy as authorized by the pharmacist. Non-licensed staff such as pharmacy clerks may not make an offer for the pharmacist to counsel. In paren four, regardless of mandatory situations, pharmacists must always honor patients' requests for counseling on any medication or device. And in paren five, pharmacists must ensure communication accessibility for patients who prefer languages other than English or use signed language. When a pharmacist is not proficient in the patient's preferred language, they must seek the assistance of a qualified healthcare interpreter registered with the Oregon Health Authority. 
In parent six, when counseling is provided solely in writing, the pharmacist must ensure that information is accessible to the patient. This includes clear and understandable language, an appropriate format, and contact information. In parent seven, patients have the right to refuse pharmacist counseling. However, there's some important considerations. If the counseling is mandatory, only licensed staff can accept a patient's refusal. Ensure they must ensure proper documentation and communication with the prescriber if necessary. Note, this is a change from previous rules about technicians. Any licensed staff member may accept a patient's refusal for pharmacist consultation. In Paren B, pharmacists still have the discretion to withhold dispensing the medication until counseling is completed, especially if they have concerns about patient safety or medication misuse potential. In Paren 8, pharmacists must always uphold patient privacy and confidentiality during counseling sessions. In Paren 9, counseling, offers to counselor, or declinations in counseling regarding prescriptions must be documented with the licensee's identity. This means that if a technician makes the offer for the pharmacist to counsel, the technician's identity must be documented as the licensee who made the offer. If a pharmacist counsels, the pharmacist identity must be documented. And if the patient declines the offer of counseling, the identity of the licensee who accepted the declination must be documented. In paren 10, when required by federal laws or regulations, pharmacists must provide additional forms of drug information to supplement verbal counseling. This includes items like medication guides and patient package inserts that are part of the FDA approved prescription drug label for certain drugs. Now let's transition to a few prohibited practices for pharmacists. Pharmacists can only dispense, distribute, or deliver drugs while working for a registered drug outlet pharmacy. If pharmacists are working independent of a drug outlet, they cannot dispense, distribute, or deliver drugs. In paren two, pharmacists cannot personally possess or store drugs outside of a registered drug outlet pharmacy, except for when drugs are legally prescribed for their own personal use, or drugs are possessed or stored within the usual course of business and within the pharmacist's scope of practice. In paren three, the board motioned at the December 2023 board meeting to send a repeal of paren three to rulemaking. It is important to note that while the proposed revision to the rule will be silent regarding the removal of the word diagnosis, this proposed change does not in any way authorize pharmacists to diagnose medical conditions as that is not currently within the statutory scope of the practice of pharmacy as defined in ORS 689-005 paren 31. Diagnosis remains the exclusive domain of licensed healthcare professionals within their respective scopes of practice. In paren four, pharmacists are strictly prohibited from engaging in any form of discrimination, harassment, intimidation, or assault. In paren five, pharmacists must not allow interns, certified organ pharmacy technicians, or pharmacy technicians to perform tasks beyond the pharmacist's own training and qualifications. For example, if a pharmacist is not trained to perform sterile compounding or immunizations, the pharmacist must not allow other licensees under their supervision to perform this task. In paren six, pharmacists must not permit non-licensed pharmacy personnel to engage in activities that constitute the practice of pharmacy or assistance in the practice of pharmacy. In addition, non-licensed personnel can only perform functions explicitly permitted by the supervising pharmacist, ensuring appropriate oversight and adherence to scope of practice regulations. This rule outlines the qualifications, limitations, and future training requirements for PICs in Oregon. In paren 1, to become a PIC, pharmacists must either have one year of pharmacy practice experience or complete a board-provided PIC training course to be eligible for the PIC role. Two, the PIC training course can be completed before or within 90 days after the appointment as PIC. In paren C, only pharmacists employed by the drug outlet can be designated as PIC. In paren 2, to prevent overextension and ensure adequate oversight, a pharmacist cannot be designated PIC of more than three pharmacies simultaneously. However, this limit does not apply to pharmacy prescription kiosks and lockers that are regulated by other specific rules. 
In paren three, starting July 1, 2025, all PICs must complete a board provided PIC training course at least every five years to maintain their qualifications. This, is ongo this ongoing education ensures PICs stay up to date on regulations, best practices, and evolving legal requirements. Earlier in the presentation, I talked about how these new regulations are designed to encompass the diverse nature of pharmacy practice in today's world, where pharmacists aren't always combined to brick and mortar stores. Therefore, you saw some of the responsibilities previously assigned to the pharmacist in charge now falling on every pharmacist, regardless of their practice set. Now let's talk about the responsibilities that still remain solely in the PIC's domain. In paren 1A, the PIC must not be a passive figurehead. They must be actively participating in pharmacy activities, demonstrating leadership and involvement in the day-to-day -day operations. In paren 1B, the PIC cannot solely rely on remote management. They must be physically present at the pharmacy on a regular basis, spending sufficient time to fulfill their responsibilities effectively. In paren 1C, the PIC assumes the ultimate responsibility for the entire pharmacy's conduct, operation, management, and control. As you may recall from an earlier slide, that any pharmacist working in a drug outlet is responsible for the daily conduct, operation, and management, and control of the pharmacy, but the PIC is responsible for the ongoing conduct. While all pharmacists share core responsibilities, the PIC of a drug outlet and pharmacy shoulders additional duties to ensure a safe and compliant practice. In paren one, the PIC must create, maintain, and enforce written policies and procedures that govern how pharmacy is practiced within the drug outlet. These policies must comply with all relevant federal and state laws and regulations. In paren two, they must maintain complete and accurate records of all pharmacy operations. In parent three, they must establish and maintain a quality, a continuous quality improvement program for the pharmacy. As PIC, if an inspection of your pharmacy identifies any issues, you must develop a plan to correct those issues, outlining specific steps to address them and submit the plan within the time frame allowed by the board. You must conduct a thorough review of your pharmacy's operations every year by July 1st. Follow the following the board provided self-inspection form to ensure a comprehensive assessment of all critical areas. You must also complete a self-inspection form within 15 days of becoming a PIC, and the form must have your signature and date on the completed forms, and they must be kept for three years for record keeping purposes. As PIC, you're responsible for ensuring accurate and consistent inventory counts of controlled substances. This involves conducting physical counts and reconciling any discrepancies with records. Here are the specific timeframes. For all controlled drugs, it has to occur within 15 days of a change in PIC and at least once every 367 days to maintain ongoing control. For Schedule II controlled drugs, it must be done every 93 days in a retail drug outlet and every 31 days in an institutional drug outlet. And finally, the pharmacist in charge of a drug outlet pharmacy, you have additional responsibilities depending on the type of pharmacy you operate. If the pharmacy falls under any of the following categories, you must also comply with the PIC responsibilities outlined in the pharmacy prescription kiosk in OAR 855-141, pharmacy prescription lockers in 855-143, and remote dispensing site pharmacies in 855-139. Now we're going to move into the services that a pharmacist may choose to provide. If the pharmacist provides the service, then they must follow the rules for the type of service. The first service listed in the rule is OAR 855-115-0300, Consulting Practice. When providing services to a licensed healthcare facility in Oregon, pharmacists must fulfill all duties and responsibilities mandated by the facility's license, along with any relevant federal and state regulations. For some healthcare facilities like correctional facilities, long-term care facilities, community-based care facilities, hospital drug rooms, or certain charitable pharmacists that do not have that does not have additional pharmacist service requirements under the terms of its licensure with any other state agency, the pharmacist has additional responsibilities beyond general compliance. 
These include, but are not limited to, developing and implementing policies and procedures governing the secure storage and distribution of drugs within the facility, providing guidance on accurate and proper documentation of drug administration, dispensing, offering educational materials or programs as requested by the facility. Additionally, a pharmacist providing services to an organ licensed healthcare providers must strictly follow all applicable state and pharmacy federal laws related to pharmacy practice. In parent four, pharmacists must maintain thorough records for their services for at least three years, specifically those related to the requirements outlined in rules two through four of this regulation. These records should be readily available for the board by, for inspection. In parent five, Pharmacists may store protected health records outside of the organ license facility, but only if the storage method aligns with the specific permissions granted in OAR 855-104-0055, which is the universal records rule that we talked about earlier. And in parent six, all relevant records and documents must adhere to the retention guidelines. Again, that universal record retention rule. OAR 855-115-0305 applies to all drug administration, regardless of the medication. Whether it's a vaccine or a long-acting antipsychotic administered by a pharmacist, these rules must be followed. Under Oregon law, pharmacists can administer vaccines, drugs, or devices to patients, but only under certain conditions. One, following a prescriber's order. The pharmacist must have a valid prescription or order from a licensed healthcare provider who is authorized to prescribe the medication or vaccine or other treatment. Two, following a statewide protocol. The pharmacist can administer the vaccine, drug, or device if it's part of an approved statewide drug therapy management protocol, which outlines specific guidelines for pharmacists to follow. Or three, following a clinical pharmacy agreement or collaborative drug therapy management agreement. The pharmacist can administer if there's a clinical pharmacy agreement or collaborative drug therapy management agreement in place with a healthcare provider, which outlines the pharmacist's responsibilities and scope of practice in managing specific medications or treatments. Paren 2 outlines additional requirements for pharmacists administering vaccines, drugs, or devices in Oregon. Before giving any injectable drug or device, the pharmacist must receive practical training on both the correct in injection site and the appropriate administration technique used for that specific medication or device. Please note this training requirement does not apply to orally administered drugs. Paren B, pharmacists must maintain active CPR certification. This certification must meet the following criteria. It must be issued by the American Heart Association, Red Cross, or other equivalent program specifically designed for healthcare providers. It must be specific to the age and population for which the pharmacist is administering vaccines, drugs, or devices. It must include hands-on training component to ensure practical skills and CPR techniques, and it must be valid for not more than three years. Pharmacists must maintain the current certification and retain the records according to the universal record rule. In 2C, pharmacists must ensure that any medication administered patient has been properly stored following the rules laid out in OAR 855-041-1036. In paren 2D, after administering a vaccine, drug, or device, the pharmacist must watch for any immediate reactions or changes in the patient's condition, monitor the patient for any potential side effects, Document any observed effects in the patient's record and report any serious adverse events to the appropriate authorities as required. If necessary, the pharmacist needs to take appropriate action based on the patient's response. In paren E, pharmacists may make sure that they give any vaccine, drug, or device to the patient that is documented in the patient's permanent medical record. This includes both electronic and paper-based records. In paren F, pharmacists must keep all records and documents according to the universal record retention rule. Um, key information that should be in the administration record includes information clearly identifying the patient, specific medication or device that was administered, the dosage or strength of the medication that was given, how and where it was given, the exact date and time when it was given, and the name or ID of the pharmacist to administer it. Paren 3 focuses on additional rules for specifically for pharmacists administering vaccines in Oregon. 
When dealing with vaccines, pharmacists must comply with all the requirements I just went over in paren 2 and the following additional regulations. In paren 3A, the pharmacist must complete specific training before administering or supervising vaccine administration. The training must cover hands-on injection technique, clinical evaluation of vaccine indications and contraindications, and recognition and treatment of emergency reactions to vaccines. Pharmacists can obtain the training through various approved programs, which are programs accredited by Ameri the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, or ACPE, curriculum-based programs offered by an ACPE accredited pharmacy school or college, state or local health department training programs, training programs approved by the Board of Pharmacy, or training provided by an appropriately qualified healthcare practitioner. In paren 3B, pharmacists must actively provide recommendations to patients about which vaccines they might need based on factors such as age, health status, lifestyle, travel plans, or current vaccination status. This involves reviewing a patient's medical history and considering relevant guidelines to make informed recommendations for appropriate immunizations. In paren C, Pharmacists have the authority to select the specific vaccines to be administered to each patient, taking into account the recommendations made, the patient preference, and any potential contraindications. In paren D, the pet pharmacist must double check that they are following all the requirements outlined in the rule, which cover that they're acting under a valid prescription order from a licensed practitioner, adhering to a statewide drug therapy management protocol, or operating within a clinical pharmacy agreement or collaborative drug therapy management agreement. In paren E, pharmacists must ensure that the patient or the representative is provided with the appropriate vaccine information statement for each vaccine dose prior to administration. And before giving any vaccine, pharmacists must perform a thorough verification process to ensure accuracy and safety. They need to double check that the prescription or order for the vaccine is correct, complete, and valid, making sure the patient's name, the specific vaccine ordered, the dosage, and any special instructions. They need to carefully review the vaccine product itself and ensure it matches the prescription as in a good condition, including checking expiration date, its storage conditions, and any visible signs of damage or tampering. In paren G, pharmacists must advise and counsel patients about each vaccine they receive, covering essential information, such as the benefits of the vaccine, describing the ingredients of the vaccines, discussing potential side effects, and providing clear instructions on how, what to do if they have any side effects. Pharmacists must be prepared to manage any adverse events or reactions that occur after vaccine administration, Pharmacists are also responsible for reporting any adverse events that occur after vaccine administration to two key entities. So one is VAERS, we mentioned that one earlier, and the other is possibly the patient's primary care provider, if the patient has a primary care provider. Uh, pharmacists must carefully review and verify the accuracy and completeness of all documentation related to vaccine administration, including when an intern or a technician administers the vaccine. This includes making sure the medical record accurately reflects the vaccines given, the date of administration, any observed reactions or side effects. Pharmacists are accountable for ensuring that anyone administering vaccines under their supervision has appropriate training and qualifications. Pharmacists must follow the guidance guidelines outlined in the Centers for Disease Control and Pre Prevention Vaccine and Storage Handling Toolkit. This toolkit provides comprehensive instructions on storage temperatures for different vaccines, safe handling procedures to prevent con contamination or damage, inventory management practices, and emergency preparedness measures. In paren M, pharmacists must have ready um, access to the current edition of the CDC reference book, Epidemiology and Prevention of Vaccine Preventable Diseases, also known as the Pink Book. In paren four, pharmacists are authorized to not only administer medications or devices, but also provide training to patients or their designated agents on how to administer or self-administer them. In paren 5, all records and documents related to the medication or device administration must be retained in accordance with the universal records rule. 
In paren six, under specific conditions, pharmacists can delegate certain vaccine administration duties to interns and pharmacy technicians. A pharmacist can allow appropriately trained and qualified intern to perform the same duties as a pharmacist in vaccine administration, except for those tasks specifically prohibited under the prohibited task rule in OAR 855-120-0150. Prohibited tasks in that rule include um, practicing pharmacy unless authorized by the supervising pharmacist or healthcare provider, and certain limitations for interns during their first academic year. A pharmacist can permit a certified organ pharmacy technician or pharmacy technician who has received appropriate training to physically administer vaccines as long as it aligns with OAR 855-125-0305. That rule permits an appropriately trained and qualified technician to perform the physical act of administering a vaccine under the supervision of an appropriately trained and qualified pharmacist. This was a new law that passed in 2023, House Bill 2486, and it became effective on January 1st, 2024. While pharmacists in Oregon can play a role in ordering and receiving laboratory tests, this authority is limited to specific circumstances. In Paren 1, um, pharmacists can order tests when managing drug therapy under a formal agreement with a healthcare provider, such as clinical pharmacy agreement or collaborative drug therapy management agreement. In Paren B, pharmacists can order tests when providing patient care services within the scope of a post diagnostic formulary. This formulary is a list of medications that pharmacists can prescribe or manage independently, typically for specific conditions after a diagnosis has already been confirmed. In paren C, pharmacists can order tests when providing patient care services according to the terms of the protocol uh, approved by the Board of Pharmacy. These protocols outline specific guidelines for pharmacists to manage certain conditions, including the authority to order specific tests. In paren 1D, pharmacists can also order laboratory tests when authorized under a valid health screen testing permit. This permit issued by the Oregon Health Authority allows qualified individuals to conduct specific health screening tests within defined parameters. In paren E, pharmacists can order tests to monitor a patient's therapeutic response or adverse effects to a specific drug therapy. In paren 2, Pharmacies as entities can perform certain laboratory tests if permitted under ORS 689-661. This statute outlines the specific conditions and requirements for pharmacies to engage in laboratory testing activities. There is also a new rule in, on the operation of a laboratory and a drug outlet pharmacy in OAR 855-041-1190 that further explains when and how a pharmacy can operate a laboratory. And paren three, as always, pharmacies and pharmacists must maintain accurate records and documents related to laboratory testing activities, adhering to the record retention rule in Division 104. OAR 855-115-0315 relocates existing collaborative drug therapy management rules from OAR 855-019-0260 with no modifications. Collaborative drug therapy management is a process that allows pharmacists and healthcare practitioners to work together as a team to manage a patient's drug therapy more effectively. It involves a formal agreement outlining their shared responsibilities and ensuring coordinated care. Key features of a CDTM in Oregon include a written agreement initiated by a practitioner authorizing the pharmacist involvement in the managing of drug therapy under the agreement. Each agreement is specific to an individual patient's need and treatment plan. There are two primary types of CDTM agreements. One is a one-on-one -on -one agreement. A CDTM agreement can be made between a single practitioner and a single pharmacist. Or there can be a group agreement with multiple practitioners and an organized medical group who can enter into a CDTM agreement with one or more pharmacists. Paren 2 outlines the specific elements required in the written agreement and collaborative drug therapy management organ. The agreement must clearly identify each participating pharmacist, either by name or specific description. The agreement must also identify each participating practitioner or group of practitioners, either by name or specific description. And it must designate the principal pharmacist and principal practitioner who are responsible for overseeing the CDTM arrangement. 
These individuals are accountable for creating and implementing the CDTM, ensuring proper training for all farm assistant practitioners involved in the CDTM, managing the administration of the CDTM, and monitoring and evaluating the CDTM's effectiveness and making necessary changes. This part of the regulations dives deeper into details of what a pharmacist can do with a CDTM agreement in Oregon. It essentially lays out a pharmacist decision-making framework and the communication protocols with the collaborating prescriber. In 2 little da, the rules clearly define the types of decisions the pharmacist is permitted to make, which should include the diseases, drugs, and categories, the allowed activities. In paren 2b, DB, the agreement must provide detailed description of the methods, procedures, and decision criteria the pharmacist should follow when, ma when making the allowed activities. In paren 2DC, the rule emphasizes the importance of meticulous documentation. Pharmacists must document all decisions made within the CDDM process, define clear mechanisms for frequent communication with the collaborating practitioner, reporting on the patient's response to the medication, promptly reporting any side effects or adverse effects experienced by the patient, and specify where the documentation will be kept, whether it's in the prescription record, the patient profile, or separate other system. In paren 2DD, the agreement must outline the specific circumstances that trigger mandatory communication between the pharmacist and the practitioner. In paren 2, delves into further aspects of a CDTM in Oregon. Paren 2E, the agreement must specify training requirements for pharmacists who are participating in the CDTM. In paren 2F, the CDTM must include procedures for quality assurance and periodic review. In paren 2G, the agreement must clearly state the practitioner authorizes the pharmacist to participate in CDTM for covered patients. In paren 2H, to ensure continued effectiveness and compliance with the regulations, the CDTM agreement must be reviewed and updated at least two, every two years. In paren three, pharmacies must retain the CDTM agreement and all associated records. The records must be readily accessible to any relevant health licensing board upon request. In paren four, the section clarifies the CDTM agreement does not grant pharmacists the authority to engage in the therapeutic substitution outside of the agreement scope. Medication therapy management or MTM is a specialized ser service or set of services aimed at optimizing patient therapeutic outcomes delivered independently by a pharmacist or in conjunction with medication provision with objectives including enhancing appropriate medication use, improving adherence, detecting adverse events, fostering collaboration between practitioners and pharmacists, and ultimately improving patient outcomes. A pharmacist delivering medication therapy management services must tailor them to the individual patient's needs, encompassing activities such as conducting a health status assessment, formulating a medication treatment plan, monitoring therapy safety and effectiveness, and making decisions on medication therapy in consultation with the practitioner when necessary. The pharmacist must also ensure individualized care involving activities such as medication reviews to identify and resolve problems, monitoring for adverse drug events, and providing education and training on medication use when appropriate. In providing MTM services, a pharmacist must document the care, including communication with the healthcare provider, and retain records in accordance with the universal records rule. The Multidisciplinary Public Health and Pharmacy Formulary Committee, also known as PFAC, was convened in 2018 pursuant to legislation that enacted ORS 689645 and ORS 689649. The rule in OAR 855-115-0330 to OAR 855-115-0345 established the pharmacist authority and responsibilities in prescribing drugs and devices pursuant to the formulary and protocols that are developed and recommended by the committee. The rules articulate the authority and legal expectations for an Oregon licensed pharmacist practicing in Oregon to voluntarily participate in providing patient assessment and patient care services that may result in the issuance of a prescription by a pharmacist for an identified medical need. 
In paren one, an Oregon licensed pharmacist is authorized to prescribe and dispense FDA approved drugs and devices listed on the formulary or protocol compendia. And in paren two, may submit concepts for additions to these compendia or provide feedback through the prescribed forms to the Public Health and Pharmacy Formulary Advisory Committee. In paren three, a pharmacist is ob obligated to prescribe drugs or devices within the parameters of the formulary and protocol compendia adhering to federal and state regulations. And in paren four, pharmacists must recognize the limits of their knowledge and experience, resolving situations beyond their expertise by consulting with or referring patients to another healthcare provider. When prescribing drugs or devices via the formulary or protocol compendia in paren 5A, a pharmacist must ensure completion of the required training and education, retain documentation according to the universal records rule. In 5B, gather comprehensive health information from the patient, and in 5C, assess the collected information. If the prescribed item is on the formulary compendia, the pharmacist must obtain a diagnosis from the patient's healthcare provider prior to prescribing. Any physical assessments must be conducted in person and face-to-face. -face. When prescribing drugs via the formulary or protocol compendia in 5D, the pharmacist must create an individualized patient-centered care plan based on the assessment, and in 5E, implement the plan by addressing the medication and health-related problems, initiating or modifying medication therapy, providing education, contributing to care coordination, and scheduling follow-up care as needed to achieve therapy goals. In paren 5F, the pharmacist must monitor and modify the care plan as needed. 5G, provide timely notification to the patient's primary care provider or other care providers within five business days. And in paren 6, if the consultation provided is through electronic means, the pharmacist must use an audio-visual communication system as defined in OAR 855-006. And in parent seven, the pharmacist must retain all records according to the universal records rule. In OAR 855-115-0335, prohibited practices related to prescribing, a pharmacist is prohibited from prescribing a drug or device via the formulary or protocol compendia for themselves or when the compendia necessitates a referral to a non-pharmacist provider. Additionally, in paren two, while a pharmacist may allow, they must not require a patient to schedule an appointment for the prescribing or administering of an injectable hormonal contraception or prescribing or dispensing of a self-administered hormonal contraceptive. And finally, the list of items that can be prescribed via the formulary compendia based on a documented diagnosis by a healthcare provider can be found in OAR 855-115-0340. This list currently includes items such as diabetic blood test, blood sugar testing supplies, injection supplies, nebulizers, and the like. A pharmacist may prescribe certain FDA-approved drugs and devices according to specific protocols listed in OAR 855-115-0345. This list currently includes cough and cold medications, contraceptions, um, HIV prevention medication, and vaccines, to name a few. The protocols can be found on the board's website under the Public Health and Pharmacy Formulary Advisory Committee link. This concludes the rule review portion of this program. To keep up with Board of Pharmacy rule changes and other hot topics, please make sure you're signed up to receive the Board of Pharmacy newsletters. These newsletters communicate important information to licensees and registrants and help keep you up to date. You are automatically added to the board listserv called Gov Delivery based on your license type. However, if you don't keep your email address updated with the board, you will not receive these time sensitive notices. You can also sign up for newsletters board agendas and mailings, and rulemaking or adopted rules notices by clicking on the subscriptions link at the bottom of the board's homepage or as shown here with the subscriptions and newsletters link in the resources bucket. With the board's online eGov system, licensees can maintain their own record and upload documents directly into their profile. To update your profile, go to the board website, go to the licensees bucket, and click on update or renew my license or registration. First time users will need to click on register for a new personal account and returning users will use their previously created credentials to access the account.
with the My License eGov link. Once you're logged into eGov, use the menu on the upper left-hand side of the page to update your current contact information, address, phone, email, and appointment. Remember, you have 15 days to do this. And you can also upload documents, such as your CE certificates, as required by rule. Also, in the menu box, you can renew your license, request certified copies of your license, and pay invoices. Please know that there is a compliance officer on duty each day to respond to licensee and registrant questions. They can be reached by emailing pharmacy.compliance at bop.oregon.gov or by calling the board office at 971-673-0001. Because board staff often work remotely, you may receive a faster response to an email versus a phone call. We understand that navigating board regulations can be confusing, so we're happy to help. When you have questions about the board's laws and rules, agency staff are here to offer assistance. Here's what we can do. We can point you in the right direction. We can help you find the relevant statutes and rules that apply to your specific situation, including links for easy access. We can share additional resources. If available, we can provide helpful information like past newsletter articles or board statements that address similar topics. We can offer you a starting point. Keep in mind that our resources are really just a starting point and we encourage you to explore the statutes and rules further for complete understanding. Here's what we can't do. We can't give legal advice. Providing legal interpretations and explanations requires legal expertise. and We recommend consulting an attorney for specific legal advice. We cannot predict board decisions. Each board review is unique, and the board carefully considers each case before reaching a decision. We also can't offer guarantees. We can't guarantee a specific outcome, but we assure you that the board follows a fair and thorough process. Again, we're here to help. Feel free to reach out with any questions you have, and we'll do our best to assist you in navigating the regulations. And that wraps up this presentation. If you would like to receive Continuing Pharmacy Education, or CPE, you will need to complete a quiz on the content and an evaluation of this course. The program code for this presentation is APPLE, like the fruit, A-P-P-L-E. You will need to enter this code in all caps to complete the program quiz and evaluation located on the board's Continuing Education webpage. Alternatively, you can use the QR code on the screen to be taken directly to the program quiz and evaluation. A completion certificate will be emailed to you six to eight weeks after completion of the quiz and program evaluation. Please note that while these informational programs are board approved for CPE, they are not accredited by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, or ACPE. Therefore, completion of these programs will not automatically appear in your NABP CPE monitor. If you want to track non-ACPE credits like this program in the CPE monitor, you can upgrade to the NABP CPE Monitor Plus program for an annual fee. This upgrade allows you to manually upload credits from this program and others like it. Alternatively, you can upload the course completion certificate for this program into your eGov profile to comply with CPE record retention requirements and OAR 855-135. And of course, if you ever have a question or concern, don't hesitate to contact us directly at the phone or emails listed on this page. <laughs>